The unique thing with Africa is that one always thinks he's related to another. And so it should not surprise you where I've come from. My brother from another mother occupied the West Wing of the White House for eight years. <laughs> and I only dropped by to bring the birth certificate some of you have been raining down on him had on. <laughs> At the age of eight, my mom introduced me to kitchen farming and gardening. And by the age of 10, I was already in business, helping us sell in a side hustle, sell clothing materials in an expansive province to our fellow teachers and colleagues. I know some of you would call that child labor, but me, I prefer to call myself a child pr childpreneur. Because at that very age, I had my dreams, and I loved business from a very tender age. As a dream, I also believe that why not for an enforced 18-year 18 18 period of absence? I could as well be rivaling Bill Gates on the dollar pyramid. Just don't forget I said it's a dream. <laughs> and dreams get valid. But it wasn't to be. Where was I for the 18 years I've talked about? For 18 years I was separated from society. I was on death row convicted for a crime I didn't commit. But that's not the issue today. The issue here is I discovered myself even though on death row. Death row wasn't going to stop me from achieving what was in me. And so sitting back there in prison, looking around, I noticed that 70% plus of the inmates incarcerated in Kenya are chaps below 35 years of age, youthful guys, Many a time we look at the millennials and complain, the Generation X, and say they are going into crime and we don't understand why. But society must also understand that we've boxed them in. We don't give them opportunities. We label them, we call them names, we call them lazy. And so they find refuge in crime as an identity. And so when I'm in prison, I realize that many things are happening and these youth need an opportunity. How did I end up in prison? How would you explain walking up to a police station? Not anywhere else. A place where you think you'll find refuge and find justice? To be appraised the circumstances under which your wife had been brutally killed and the body found right outside the police station fence and you end up being locked and charged with her murder. But it happened to me courtesy of a broken down judicial system, beset by wanton corruption, prejudices and anything you, know, you name, it happened to me. But that did not stop me from dreaming. Being locked up 23 and a half hours a day, where the sun was a luxury, in an eight by seven foot cell with 13 other grown up men, did not stop me from dreaming and for coming up with a concept that I truly believed was going to help change our nation. And since I came out on presidential pardon in October of 2016, I've been purposefully spending my time with the youth in the community and listening to them. Because as I said earlier, 70% of the people in prison are the youth. What's a better way than to go where they are? Stay with them, work with them, listen to them. Just give them that listening ear and learn the best from them. And when I look at them, when I talk to them, these youth, all they tell me is that it's the opportunities they don't have. They need to break out of the mold. They have what it takes to move the world and my country forward. And so when we form Crime See Poor, Crime See Poor means crime is not cool. The remit was just to get the youth out of crime and to use social enterprise as a means of fighting recidivism. As I was talking about the billions they could be rivaling Bill Gates on, I know we have an $80 billion question today to handle. And the $80 billion question is, as America has the highest rate of incarcerated inmates, that is the amount you're spending every year to keep guys in prison. 
funds that we can use in more productive sources. And so in prison, instead of confrontation, we decided to use targeted engagement with those in authority. We decided to get them to know what we were going through and how we could be part of the solution to the problem. And we ensured that every voice of every inmate in Kenya was heard. And that's how, through that targeted engagement, in Kenya, inmates are allowed to vote because it's a case we took to court. In Kenya today, as I'm speaking, the mandatory death penalty has been removed by a case filed by inmates. It just showed me that instead of stigmatizing people and seeing their lost causes, a phrase normally used by vested interest, people who just want large populations in prisons for particular reasons which we know about, those vested interests, when we look deeper into what they mean for the society, they just mean the 80 billion is going to go higher for us. When we can actually bring it down by focusing and targeting the at-risk youth group in our communities and also those coming out of prison. When you look at Nelson Mandela, think of Gandhi. Think of Martin Luther King Jr. Well-known icons, people we revere, but they are all people who are in prison for one reason or another at a certain time. Why do we treat them so differently from our next door neighbors who are coming out of prison for sometimes lesser offenses than what these icons were charged with or put in prison for? Does it not sear our conscience that we become so judgmental and feel that we should do what's demanded and expected of us? There are ways through which we can help change the narrative because the modern day inmate is not going to be defined by what took him to prison but by the skills they've learned in prison, by the focus, the drive, and the tenacity they have to make the world a better place with their inborn and innate talent. When you look at the Baltimore area, for example, you look at the bigger picture in America, we have wonderful organizations helping in the reentry program, which is one step to welcoming people at home. It's just upon us to ask ourselves how much we support these reentry programs in our own community. Because don't forget, the total, the net effect of what we are looking at is how we can bring down the public expenditure on incarceration. The reentry programs around us, we can support them. The second way in which we can do this is to follow the Sir Richard Branson way. What is Sir Richard Branson doing? with his virgin trains. He is employing ex-inmates. Men and women who are being given a second chance. Men and women who have a talent pool that can be exploited by each and every single member of this society to make the world a better place. And that's why we focused as crime support and my passion from what I learned at the age of 10, that we can use business, best practices, with the discipline we get from these guys who've been in prison, like me, synergize it and make this world a better place. And so right where I was for the better part of my life, which is a supermax prison in Kenya, if you go to the Google Maps and you'll see, Kamiti Prison was rated as one of the 15 worst prisons in the world, top 15. We are torture in supreme, but which now has been changed by a system that's willing to help people live humanely and find themselves. In our, research, in our resource center in the prison, we are using flip-flops collected from waterways to make art. We are saving the environment, and these inmates today, they have self-trained and they're training their colleagues and they've even been assisted to open bank accounts where they're depositing a bigger percentage of the profits that they derive from what they're getting 
to help them not only support their families while in prison, from prison, but also to assist them in the reentry process when they go home. The same is happening in the sister prison, which is the largest in Kenya, Langata Women Prison, where wonderful women are making artifacts that can compete with the very best in the world. They are finding their self-esteem in just doing social enterprise. They are also realizing that they don't need to be dependent on their spouses upon release. And so when they go home, they not only have their savings, but they become self-reliant entrepreneurs who need a landing base. And so as we go on, we realize that we need more space. Today we've moved from the dingy cell, eight by seven where we started this organization, and we've just moved into a big 2,000 square foot cell, uh, office space. We are going to have the first resource center manned and run by ex-inmates to train and offer opportunities both to ex-inmates and a risk youth group in society so that they don't get into crime in the first place. The second thing we are doing. The second thing, based on credibility, based on the focus and the drive, we've also been offered land in one of the largest conservancies in Kenya, where we are going to put up a halfway home for those who can't find somewhere to go, similar to what we have in America here. We are going to put up a halfway home for both gender to start their lives afresh. For as long as it will take them to acclimatize and get into the society, we are going to stand with them and support them. Why do I say that? Because only last month, in New York, I was invited to the Innocence Project Gala. And I met people who were broken. People had been taken to prison and convicted for things they didn't commit. People who can't start their lives afresh because they've been marked as felons, even though they've paid the price, the ultimate price for being in prison, and they can't get jobs, they can't be readmitted to college, and that's where social enterprise comes in. Because we believe it debunks the myth that those who come out of prison or challenging circumstances are unemployable. We believe social justice makes everyone, social justice and social entrepreneurship, makes everyone be treated as humanely as they should be. And so I come all the way to Maryland today because I believe in the redemptive power of second chances, and I believe also in the ability of social enterprise to make this world be a better place for us. When I walk into prisons today, and I see the smile and hope in the eyes of my ex-colleagues, I see that they count on me, that I'll speak about what they're going through. It's not only my colleagues in Kenya, anywhere and everywhere, that I'll speak on what they go through, on what they feel about how society is and can be, because they have what it takes to help us move this world forward. I'll just finish with one word. We should know what's in us, and let's do what's right in us. To check out Ed Jackson's words in the book, in the bestseller, in the thriller, H.I. Hey, Love You. It's not time to take the blame and say that we've not done it. We can do it. Because if we don't, as Ed Jackson Brown says, 20 years from today, you'll be so sorry and more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things you did. And so it's time to throw off the ball lines, sail, sail, sail away from your safe harbors, cut the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. Discover that social enterprise is a community-empowering initiative that shifts focus from excuses and brings us to the real issues in such a way we are going to realize and accept that recidivism, fighting recidivism, unlocks funds for holistic growth for the nation. And just by doing that, we'll have made the world a better and safer place. Thank you.